This episode of La Foodie Noir is brought to you by the Food Truck Scholar. Be sure to like and follow on social media and visit the website, thefoodtruckscholar.com to learn more about black owned food trucks in your area and about resources for current and aspiring black food truck owners. The revolution will be mobilized. Hey, Dwayne, how's it going? What's going on? What's going on? Hey, I'm uh, good. I think we both on the ground today. I actually just came from a meeting, mm. and then I'm going back to work, and I got the salt. Oh, you got you got the stuff. You got the salt. Hey, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Uh, I'm here. I got, I got it all. You know, oh, watch yourself now. Watch yourself. That look like a purple. I got apron. it. I got it. Okay. I got it. I appreciate you showing love, you know, because, you know, purple is my favorite color. Oh, well, you know, so. that's, that's, that's going to always be. Love got to give what love gets, you know what I'm saying? It's all good. So we uh, we're all working, we working hard here in Alabama. Just uh, been up since bright and early this morning, like the wee hours. I'm talking about 5 o'clock, getting that thing going, mm -hmm. you know. Um, they call it slow and low around here. You got to smoke it, you know what I'm saying? No artificial, yeah. no... Uh, no rotisserie, none of that. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking straight back firewood, <laughs> having the neighbors mad with you early in the morning type stuff. You know? <laughs> okay, well, you know what this is? You're doing it like that. Uh -huh. When I come to Birmingham, like, I think I'm coming December 23rd. You know, go ahead and bring me a piece of chicken. I already got you the sauce. Be, you, know, you know where I'm going to be on the 23rd? How long are you going to be on time for? Mm. 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 About, how long, hey. long you going to be on time I love it. <laughs> I'll meet up about a week. Oh, I got you then. I come back home on the twenty sixth. I work. I have to work the day after Christmas, so I'm good. Okay. I'm good. We 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 okay, go. That's what I needed to hear. Okay. Well, since you on the grind, I'm on the grind. We're not gonna waste no time. We're gonna get this started. And you know, bear with me. Uh, I got one more <laughs> paper for finals, and once that's done, I got to you know go back, edit this video, send it to you, so that we can also have a copy to upload to YouTube to make sure that. A lot of people get to see it who weren't on the live stream today. Is that cool? Oh, that's that's definitely cool. I um uh, I appreciate you having me on. I thank you uh for this opportunity, you know what I'm saying? Uh any opportunity we can get to share our story, to share our vision and just let people know, you know, how it is out here and um just tell what it is and just kinda of chop it up is always, always a blessing, you know. So I'm uh I'm just, I'm a little confused. I'm trying to figure out, do I look at you or do I look at the camera? That's why you see my hey, eyes. Hey, listen. <laughs> look, I mean, I just be looking straight at the screen. Sometimes I look at you, sometimes I look at myself to make sure that my, grass, my glasses ain't crooked or whatnot. But, hey, you, you're doing this. I'm going to do what we do. <laughs> I think if I took mine off, I, don't, I probably wouldn't be able to see nobody. So I need to make sure that the phone is still where it's at. Okay, but um, cool. let's get it started. So for those who are joining in, for those, this may be your first time watching, and for those who have been watching me for a minute, welcome back. I appreciate all of you all. My name is Ariel Smith, also known as the Food Truck Scholar or La Foodie Noir, the Black Foodie, and I am coming to you live and direct with Dwayne Thompson, the owner of Big Daddy Sauces, LLC. A little bit about me, I am a Ph.D. student in American Studies at Purdue University, and my research is actually on black-owned food trucks. And But also on the side, beyond the research and dissertation and all that boring stuff, what I love doing is highlighting black-owned food truck owners from across the country. I just came back from L.A. a couple of days ago um, in the process of heading to another city, and that's literally what I do is I travel the country finding black food truck owners and allowing them to share their story with me. You know, I've been really blessed to have people that are willing to do that. And the Food Trust Scholar exists because I want to create a space where we can hear these stories that aren't being told by the news. A lot of the great things that are happening with black business owners and just black excellence, period, that we don't get enough of. So I'm just trying to do my part to buy local and to buy black wherever I'm at. But that's enough about me. The spotlight today is on Mr. Dwayne. So I'm proud because, you know, even though, you by way of New Orleans, you still represent in Birmingham right now. You know I'm from the 205, so I'm a little biased when it comes to that city. I show love to that city whenever I can. 
So I'm going to flip it to you. And how about you just tell the people who you are and what you've been doing? Oh, man, we want to say uh, definitely props up to you. Uh, and although we, we don't have an actual food truck, you're taking out the time to hear our story. And what it's about is really definitely appreciated. Um, like you said, my name is Wayne Thompson. I am the owner of Big Daddy Sauces, LLC. But in the midst of that, I also cook. I cater from New Orleans originally. But I'm hailing and representing. You know, I just represented Alabama in the World Food Championship. So it's all good. I'm 205 bound. It's, 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 it's all right with me. You know, but I never can leave my roots. But me, with all that being said, kind of moved up here right after, you know, Hurricane Katrina. Did a seven-city tour. Um, came to Birmingham where, you know, out, outskirts of Birmingham, found it home, kind of got comfortable and uh, found out that I could get a, you know, a better education for free for my children. And with mm -hmm. that, kind of like grabbed my, you know, grabbed an anchor down. Um, so I've been there since 06, um, just doing what I do. But I was um, actually, you know, um, to tell the story of the whole little, I've always been an entrepreneur. I've always been doing something other than having a job, yeah. you know what I'm saying? I'm talking about everything from selling T-shirts to shoes. I'm one of the first with, you know, selling out the trunk, all that good stuff. Um, yeah. One of the things I learned a lot out of my um, um, entrepreneurial uh, skills and street smarts from, I was in the record business for a while. Um, I had the privilege to work under Master P, who was a just a simple wow. genius, you know what I'm saying, when it comes to street marketing and, and working from the grind. So kind of pat myself out of some of his work ethics. Uh, read his book, um, done a lot of things. That's my dude, so uh, got to give him props. A lot of people. But on giving props, but many of these dudes were getting deals and marketing and, and distrib distribution deals and all that is owed to him. I was in the office when he when he first denied, you know, to make let them have ownership, but he flipped the script on them. So big ups, be and so. After that, I just was kind of like doing my thing and working around. And one day I was looking for extra income, basically, and uh, just trying to find out how could I do something or what could I do. And, uh, you know, Lord spoke my spirit like, I've already put it in you. Like, I don't know what you're talking about, but okay, Lord. He's like, I've already put it in because I'm looking for a job now. Got one, I'm looking for another because I'm trying to make ends. What? Me. And so um, <laughs> I had already been out like on the weekends cooking. So I was out one weekend cooking and a dude walked up to me like, man, you need to put this sauce in the bottle. I'm like, man, look, it's drip. O'clock in the morning, you drunk. I'm tired. Why don't you go home? That's what you need to do. So um, that passed. So the next weekend, I was cooking outside again, outside of Barton Duty. Poked me in my chest. He's like, man, what you waiting on? Put this in a bottle. I'm like, I'm waiting for you to get your finger out of my chest. And I'm waiting for you to back up off me. Then I'm like, oh, Lord, I hear you. Got it. So um, I then uh, did some research to find out what would it take to be a uh, sauce manufacturer in, uh, in, in Alabama. Because uh, the cottage law does not uh, go across with any food that's acidic, so you can't do it out your house. You can't sell out your mm house. -hmm. You got to have the pH balance tested. You got to have, you know, um, how long you can have shelf life, mm -hmm. all that good stuff like that. So um, I ended up doing research, found out you had to be certified food manufacturer. So there was a class. They used to do the class two times a year um, in Auburn, at Auburn, at Auburn University. Just so happens they've reduced it to once a year. And so when I called, down there I got into the class like the last week or the last day that the class was being held um you had to spend a week in Auburn because it's a week-long class but you're certified nationally the 
nationally certified. So I'm a nationally certified. Food manufacturer. I can take That's my paperwork it. anywhere. Um, and so I knew then that it was a God thing because what happened was I know me. I have this thing that they like to call ADD. I don't focus on, you know what I'm saying? And if I would have had to wait a year till the class came around again, more than likely I probably wouldn't have waited. I probably been on, you know what I'm saying, something else unless I just really realized there was something God wanted me to do within that year. But um, needs to say we're three years in. This was 2015, um, March of 2015. Um, since then we have um, been blessed with doing trade shows, you know, grinding in the kitchen, making this stuff, putting it in bottles. If you go check out my Instagram, you'll see the, the progression from um, selling that trade show doing to now. We have a, a co-packer here in Birmingham. Well, not in Birmingham, but it's in uh, Alabama in a place mm -hmm. called Chancellor, Alabama. Collie Farms. Okay. It's Collie Farms is our co-packer, so we have a co-packer. Uh, we're getting it professionally made, professionally done. I've been to like two or three bottles. <coughs> Pardon me. I've been like through two or three bottles, bottle styles, bottle sizes, um, finding out that, you know, grocery stores, they like certain shapes, certain sizes, being able to mm -hmm. fit, just learning the business. Um, we've been blessed to go from, like I said, trade shows, selling out of trunks, going to different um, arts and crafts. Wherever I could get a table, I was at. <laughs> um, and so uh, one of the big things here is called Tanny Hill Trade Days. It happens okay. every third Saturday at Tanny Hill State Park. That's kind of where I got my toehold. And through selling there every month, I met an individual who uh, whose husband, and that's why I say power to the women. Y'all got the woman, y'all got the power. I came to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, she told me her husband worked for a uh, local chain. It was uh, mm -hmm. Piggly Wiggly. Food chain, Piggly Wiggly, he was a distributor and a, a buyer. So she set me up. Now, here's a true story, funny story. So the week I met her, I had already, you know, I had been grinding. So I'm calling everybody. I'm calling, trying to get me business needs and stuff. So I called Piggly Wiggly and do like, nah, you kind of knew. We ain't really, you know, doing nothing right now. We, if you run some numbers, we could look at, you, you know, for next year, adding product to the warehouse. So um, that happened like maybe a Monday or two. So I met her like that Saturday. So that next Monday, this guy calls me. He's like, hey, this is such and such from Piggly Wiggly Warehouse. Like, man, I just talked to y'all. You, you know, I ain't, I'm going I'm to get together. He's like, no, I need you to come. I'm like, so somebody playing a game with me? Like, I don't know who you spoke to before, but my name is such and such. My wife met you at such and such. She said I had to taste this stuff. I had to see what was happening with it. So I'm asking you to come in. And then so he told me to not only come in, but he asked me to bring something to taste the food on, you know. So I put it all together. Mm -hmm. I put down a little spread. I'm I'm up feeding everybody on the float. You know, well I need to feed, I'm feeding. And uh funny part was in this meeting was it was the uh I know I found this out later, but in the meeting was the actual, you know, director, mm -hmm. the um salesperson. And how about the guy who denied me the week before? They invited him into the meeting too. So I'm like, oh, oh, oh. Look at that. Tiki Taki too. But look at God. So <laughs> needless to say, um, we've been in the Piggly Wiggly Warehouse um, since then, um, just trying to get and get a lot of our business awards there because they took a chance on me. So a lot of my promotion and marketing goes towards people going to the pig, buying it out of the pig. Um, but also I'm in New Orleans at 17 stores. Bromart, Dornax, um, The Pig, Circle Food Store, a couple of seafood stores. So um, that's what we're doing. And just steady grinding.
See, there's a lot in that story I want to break down real quick because I don't want anybody to miss it. So, first of all, it's dope that you brought up, you know, your connection with Master P. I didn't even know that prior to now, but it's amazing how it ties in because my research is on how street food and just food in general needs to be considered another element of hip-hop. You know, Chris One, KRS One expanded it to nine elements to talk about street knowledge, which I heard you talk about, street entrepreneurship, and how all that's relevant. But what we leave out is how food plays a, a huge part of culture and a huge part of hip-hop culture. And so to, to see me to see you tie in the whole Master P element about how a lot of the strategy and a lot of the hustle you learn from him and watching how he's grinding in his work and all the things that he's doing, for me it's just a beautiful connection just right there off of that. And you know what a lot of people miss about any business, any company, any dream in general is that you don't automatically wake up and boom, your stuff is on a shelf or boom, you on own network or what have you. It takes those steps. So number one, I just applaud you for making sure that you dotted all your I, all your I's and crossed all your T's, you know, well, going to the class. It's funny that you would say that because now I'm gonna tell you when I um before I got into the warehouse I was going to stores individually. So the first store I went into, right, um, the lady invited me in, but she actually, you know how somebody just kind of entertaining you? Yeah. Just to be entertaining you. So she's like, oh, yeah, come in for uh, uh, an interview. We'll see. Let us see your product. Let us see. So the first thing she was surprised was, how professional the product was bottled, right? Mm -hmm. And so then she was like, well, you're going to need uh, such and such. You're going to need insurance. Oh, okay. I got that. She's like, well, you're going to need to um, have reference. Oh, I got that. But you're going to need to have, um, you know, tell us the expiration date and the expiration date is on by. I said, oh, I got that too. And she's like, well, you're going to, she, she says, so look, this is what I mean. What don't you have? She said, and this is her true word. She said, I'm going to give you an opportunity because you're one of the first, not only young, which I ain't that young, but she's like, you're one of the first young black business owners to ever come in here, and we didn't have to send you out to get something. Mm. Like, you, you know, you meet all the requirements. It's apparent that you've done your study. I said, yes, ma'am. I said, because... I don't want I don't want to have to be turned around. I don't want to have to, you know, the only thought I want you to have is, it, are we doing this or not? You know, it didn't guarantee it, but it made sure that, you know, things were where they needed to be. You know, I researched, you have to have at least a million dollar liability policy when your stuff hit the shelves. You have to have your um your breakdown of the ingredients and of the, the you know, what's in it and and what are the allergies or, you know, you have to have your um, your your uh, expiration date or when it expires and when it's good through. And also in learning in the class, you know, you have to keep track of everything. So if in case something is tainted or, or something happens, it, it's a lot that goes in. Like you said, and that's great that you said that you don't just wake up and have this stuff. You don't just wait. And you still need, you know, you, I always say you always need God on your side. If you ain't got that on your side, yes. you're fighting a losing battle regardless. I have to say that. Right. But you also, you know, you have to have the specific, you have to meet the right person at the right time. And you got to be out there. You got to constantly put your name out there. You got to put your product out there. And you, you be careful of how you treat everybody you run into. Mm, you know yes. what I'm saying? You got to be careful yes. how you treat everybody you run into. Because these days and time, you don't, it and not be there, but you don't know who know who. You don't know who's whose son. You don't know who's whose uncle, who's whose wife. Or you don't know who's a millionaire, who's not a millionaire. You know, we've been taught to look at certain stuff to figure out people. That's right. But um, I used to work for ADT Security back in the day. And I learned this. I went to a house, man. This house was crazy gorgeous, right? I'm talking about set on top of a hill. 
thought I was gonna lose my transmission trying to get up there. It was so high up in the, in the sky. <laughs> um, but when I when I got there, and I pulled in. A, it was a circle driveway. Uh -huh. I never forget. It was a Toyota Camry and a Honda in the driveway. Right, that was the two cars in the mm -hmm. driveway. And I pulled behind. I was like, That's, you know, maybe they're here cleaning up or something. I don't know. But you know, man, opened the door, got in the house. So when I went through and found out what he wanted, he wanted cameras and blah, blah, blah. Man let me in the garage, right? To show me what, what he wanted to look at, what he wanted the camera. So there's a Maybot on one side, there's a Bentley wow. on the other side, there's a Lexus 400 in the middle, you know. And he's like, oh, wow. my week. he's like, these are my weekend cars. Them cars in the front, I have to get them back and forth to work with. And from that day forward, I understood, you know what I'm saying, that you can't judge people about how you see them or what you see them in or, or, or how they dress or none of that, you know. And we just have to be mindful of how we treat people. And not just because of that, but just because it's good to treat people good. When people don't, if they say something about it, it has to be made up for the most part. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it was something and that a woman told me here at Purdue, she said, we tend to t treat people in three different ways. It's either people, scenery, or machinery. So there are some people that we treat them the way that we're supposed to treat them as people. But then we got... Some people we treat them as scenery. They just people that we just passing by. We don't pay them. No attention. They just out there, right? And we're not really engaging with them. We're not even thinking twice about who they are. They're they're just somebody there or something usually that. We're just passing by to get to our next place or whatnot. But then there's some people we treat as machinery. And as you were saying, that you know, no matter it was somebody on the floor, if it was the director, you were trying to make sure that those people got served, they got a chance to try your product in the same type of quality. But what happens is there's some people, just because of what their job description is or, you know, by the car that they drive, we treat them as less than. And we feel like they don't have as much power or authority as that person that we think we're trying to please. And what I've learned in my own experience is that I've been in rooms where it was a lot of times the secretary, the personal assistant that had just as much say-so as that CEO. And that just goes back to your point of making sure that you treat everybody with respect and that you value everything that people bring to the table. And let me tell you something. I'm glad you brought that up, too, because what we want to teach people, tell them, and I'm going to teach you something I learned a long time ago. Man, if you don't do nothing else, you don't take nothing from this video. Listen to me, listen to me well. Take care of the gatekeepers. Listen to me. Take care of the gatekeepers. If she don't want you to get on that book to be with that CEO, guess where your appointment going to go? You ain't got no openings. Or she'll stick you between a, a, a five-minute a, a six minute window mm -hmm. while you're walking in and as he walking out. You know, treat the gatekeeper bad, you're going to have problems. Treat the gatekeeper good? Oh, yeah. Because the gatekeeper may show you get so to the gatekeeper or put a nugget in the ear. A gatekeeper write a note for you. A gatekeeper will, you know, so, I mean, you can have any gatekeeper I've met. Man, I'm, I might bring flowers. I might send a card. I might. You know what I'm saying? They definitely gonna get an apron. Mm -hmm. 
they gonna get some sauce, whatever it takes for the gatekeeper. She's like, who, oh no, ma'am, I bought him one and you one. You know, and they remember that because everybody don't treat the gatekeeper right. Everybody don't realize that that the the real power. If you can't get past the gate, how you going I'm that part right there. <laughs> can't get past the gate. <laughs> You that know, part. That's one of the things that I part. want a, a lot of young entrepreneurs to learn too. And see, you know, even though you don't have a food truck yet, I know we talked about, you know, whether or not you was interested in the food truck industry. The reason why I wanted you here on there is because I talk to people who have food trucks. I talk to people who are they're now in brick and mortars, but they started out with a food truck. I talk to people who have been on, you know, nationwide television doing food truck competitions, and now they want to get a food truck. I've talked to people at different stages of this thing, right, because at each stage there's something that every person brings to the table. And I have a lot of different chefs, a lot of different food truck owners who have products, whether it's sauces or butters or what have you, and they're looking at how to get it to the next level. And I feel like part of what I'm trying to do is hopefully build a network. I'm hoping that, you know, not only is this going to create exposure to different chefs and entrepreneurs and food truck owners, but I'm also hoping that this will also be a resource or at least a networking tool where they say, hey, you know, she interviewed – this guy, she interviewed this woman. Maybe if I reach out to them or ask her to connect us, I could really bounce some ideas off this person and help them grow. Because a lot of what I've done and a lot of where I am today is really based upon, like, as you said, like, whether it was a gatekeeper or just someone that was really impressed by what I did and said, hey, you know what, maybe you should talk to this person. Or I'm going to put you in contact with this person because what you need is this and this person can help you out with it. So I'm I'm just really thankful for all the jewels. That you dropping right now, but I'm going to go back and I'm going to ask you a question that you said earlier. You said you have a co-packer. For those who don't know, like me, what is a co-packer? Okay, well, your co-packer is someone who you work with to actually professionally bottle your product um okay. and what they do or just say they uh you take a coke or pepsi they manufacture okay. their own they actually have the money and the the ability to have their own processing plant and you know do their thing run it through and all that well you have people who get to a point where it gets it grows just a little too large for you to do it by hand, um, mm -hmm. or to keep up with the request. So, say we was doing it at the trade shows and stuff, and if you start doing cases at a time at trade shows, then you have to spend time redoing it, um, making sure things are done, and it's it's only so much you can do. Whereas with a co-packer, they uh they take your 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 product, but they professionally pack it for you. They're, they they and you pay them to do so, but you you, you know you're not taking out all of the work from yourself and kind of make sure it's an adjusted price where you can still sell it for a certain price and make money. But they take away all the hard labor of doing it yourself. They put your labels on. They do all the things that that's that's needed. They test it. They um they make sure that the uh product is the same each and every time. Now a lot of people don't truly uh like to deal with co packers and things of that nature because mm -hmm. at some point in time you have to trust them with your recipe. So I'll tell anybody mm -hmm. who looks for a co packer, look for somebody, make sure somebody who they can trust and if you feel any way that you you know you can trust them, whatever, there's ways where you can send them most of it but keep out of key ingredients, all that good stuff, but for the most part, I just, you know, I had to trust God and the lady that I deal with, you know, several things that kind of 
connected us. And mm -hmm. uh, one was some of the stuff she had already packed, some of the other people she's already packing for. But it was a saying over her door that talked about faith and um, an institution of faith. So in that, I just felt real comfortable about um, doing it and um, being in partnership with her. Uh, we've been, like I said, three years, three years strong. And we're just going to, you know, till this thing outgrow to both of us. You know what I'm saying? We we gonna hang in there together and, and make something happen. But she actually has a warehouse, so you know, big trucks can pull up to it, eighteen wheeler. She has room for it. I have my own stall, all that good stuff. So it it would have to grow into a level where we have our own manufacturing plant, or where we can extend hers to be a bigger plant, or just okay. bring on more people so that she can run our product twenty four hours a day. You know, things of that nature. So a co packer is an actual company a person um who does the packing of your product for you on a professional level in bulk gotcha so the other question i have is for this has been in the making for like three years right yes so i got a lot of people that i know of that you know they're trying to work on expanding because the, in the amount of time that you've been able to do that that's pretty impressive and i salute you on that what well, that's you the been... factor right there I can't take no credit for that. Like, I've had people <laughs> told me, man, I've been doing this 10 years. How you? Man, I've been trying to do this 15 years. How you? And then you tell them, all I can say is God did it. For real, for real. They don't want to hear that answer. So they want to, they want this, you did this special thing. And I will say this, that you reap what you sow. You feel mm -hmm. me? Like, I ain't just start grinding. I've been Added since I was 14 years old, um, you know, good and bad. Uh, like I said, music business, street, you know, selling, just just having a, a knack for getting it going. So then when I finally got something to call my own, and my hustle is for, you know, right now it's about, even, even if I live to be 100, I'm almost on the second half of it, right? So now it's about having something to leave for my children, having something, a legacy. for my grandchildren. You know, I'm a father of, uh, uh, of four. I'm a grand, I have five grandchildren. You know, it's it's like, what do I do? What do how do I yeah. put something together to hopefully leave for them? And if, if you don't, at least you give them a base or a base on You know, one of the only people who know the yeah. full recipe is my baby girl. She, she can do it almost better than me. You know what I'm saying? But my other children, they they all have parts that they play in it, you know. And the opportunity is there. They don't you don't force them into the business, but they all play different parts in it, you know. And so we, I just decided that I wanted to try to, if I could, establish something to leave something for them, and if not leave it for them, at least put a foundation to show them that, you know, um, daddy had a late start, but he tried. And if y'all want to do something, this is what you need to do because I love my job. But at the same time, we know jobs, you know, and careers can end. But you can control your own destiny when you build something for yourself. And see, what I also love about that is, you know, on one hand, yeah, you know, you can create the legacy to lead to them, and they can continue that if they want. At the same time, even if, even if some of them don't choose to go that route, what you're giving them is transferable skills that they can learn on a job and say, okay, I know how to do these skills. I know how to do this because when I was with my father, these are the things that I learned. And a lot of times yeah. we don't think about We don't think about that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely enough for them to put on their resume. I mean, because to come out, of, come out of high school to be in college and put on your resume, you know, I worked three years, four years for this company as such and such. You know what I'm saying? And not saying that you're lying or manipulate. You did do that. There's a name for it. You know, you just have to know what they call it. If you sat here and put in information for me if you put if you kept up with my clients if you did my paperwork then you was an administrative assistant for my company you you assist me administratively you know what i'm saying so <laughs> if you were uh, if, if you helped me you know mix and put together batches and bottle you know i'm a frontline supervisor for the distribution of big data sauces it that's what you were see i'm gonna need you to probably redo my resume <laughs> Then use the money, make sure, make sure I'm, you know, positioning myself. Right? 
because I mean that, and that's just what it needs to be for them, you know, and yeah. for everybody. So we we have to we have to utilize what we haven't learned about what there was out there and find out why 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 we're not, you know, where we need to be, and stop making mm -hmm. excuses for why we're not where we need to be. I tell people all the time, excuses are great and they easy to come up with, but what you gonna do? What you gonna do? You gonna, I mean, yeah, I got one for you. Got near, you know what? It's raining outside right now, right? I've been cooking yeah. since five o'clock. I could have called a man and said, you know what? I ain't bring you food because it's raining. I'm gonna have to cancel that order. I, that was an excuse, right? Yeah. If they're available. But what do you do after the excuse? You mm -hmm. have to find a way around, you know what I'm saying? The excuse. You know, and we like to sometimes utilize our skin color and what we are as an excuse or where we were born, who we were raised, who, who wasn't there, who was there. I'm a product of a single mother. Five feet one, you know what I'm saying? Like a terror. She straight terror. She make it happen and put it on. You. I'm 50 years old right now. My mama didn't even know I, I cussed till I was 30 or something. And I got a, a good lick that day. She found out. So I'm just saying, you know, you, the excuses are, are just, you know, I have, um, I teach and I talk. I do motivational speaking sometimes to young to young people and to adults too. And one of the things that I Use that I have uh, three cousins who didn't have a really good upbringing, right? Um, mm -hmm. Mom was on drugs, left them in the house weekends at a time, you know, just didn't have had every excuse in the world. Not if anybody, these three had an excuse not to make it right. At, mm -hmm. at this particular time, they all have their own businesses. They're all growing and they're all doing their own thing, and they're all successful. So if people who have the ability, who have excuses, don't use them. I don't do well with people who create something. Now that's a word. That's a word right there. That's a whole word. <laughs> Might not even I mean, I didn't mean to say my preach, but I mean, that's just what it is. <laughs> but that's what you did, though. But that's what you did. So tell me, okay, which one came first? Was it the catering company or was it the barbecue sauce? Or did they kind of go hand in hand? Um, actually, the cooking came first. It just was uh, didn't have a name to it. It was just like I would do it for people. I've been I've been cooking since I was six, so just. On and off for my mother. She worked two jobs, put me through private school. I would see her come home tired, nothing to eat. So I started tinkering in the kitchen, you know what I'm saying? Lunches, mm -hmm. little breakfast, stuff like that. So I've always kind of had the little passion to cook or do stuff. But then when I get jammed up, you know, I would do hot dogs. I had a little small restaurant in New Orleans for a little while. Um, just, you know, but I've always been like, love grilling. I just always, it's just something I just love never really seen a uh not my sir out of but I was always the dude in the family who's on grill. But I this sauce that I have has always been around. And I would always make it like just the same way. Not saying I was making it itself. It just was mm -hmm. this sauce that I had perfected and this will be like when we eating this what we eating this is the sauce we eating. And so once I got that nudge that 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 prompt to put in a bottle, I knew what it was. I mean it wasn't no let me doctor on this. Let me try this. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Let me make this perfect sauce. Like, take this, what I do, put it in the bottle. Let's see what it do. So, you know, in that, in that being it, so that's that's where we went. And that's how we, we worked with it. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. So you got the catering. You, still, you got the sauce. So if you don't mind me asking, because I know sometimes it'd be secret, what's the next move that you're thinking about for your business? Well, I'm gonna tell you, I've I've um I've I've got a building, and now I'm trying to find out how to finance the 
the build out. So I don't know if I want to do crowdfunding. I don't know because of some of the things that happened in my younger years. I'm not in a position credit wise or from the, the standard, um, you know. loans of monies for you to try to you know get all the money you need to get things out so once i figure that out one of the things that i want to do is there are smaller companies and caterers who can't expand their business because the laws the laws mm. for catering are so um stringent right and although you have some great caterers who cook out their house they really have to fly underneath the radar because it's actually I guess for a better word, illegal to cook out of your house and sell food, according to the mm. standards. You have to have what wow. they call a commissary, which is called a commercial yeah. kitchen. So if you don't have a commercial kitchen and you're telling yourself there's catering, you can kind of get in trouble. So what I want to do is utilize my building as a small sandwich shop slash restaurant, not a real sit-down, maybe 10, 15 seats around the bar, whatever. Okay. But the house, my catering business, would also allow a space that other young up-and-coming caterers can come and call their own so that they can expand their brand and then get their own business out there. So that's what I'm looking at. That's the next move. And now, see, that benefits food truck owners as well because food trucks, by default, they have to have a commissary. They have yeah, definitely. To have they it. have to. But now, I don't know. My building, I have to look to see because the way my building is set up, the comps that they have, they have, they have to be able to get in, they have to be able to bring things in to clean them, stuff like that. So I don't know, you know, I have to look at the space and the guidelines. Mm -hmm. But if I can do or have one or two food trucks, up, I will. Because, you know, a lot of times, um, without the reason I'm looking at caterers is because food trucks sometimes make enough money and that's part of the, the deal. You know you need a commissary. When you do the numbers, you should crunch a number for that. But as a caterer, a small caterer, who don't do it all the time. I can't afford to really pay somebody consistently yeah, month by it. month for a commissary when I may not be making that much money. You know, I looked at a lady who does cakes. You know, it takes three hours, you know, hour to prep, another hour to bake, hour to cool. Then you got to package it. So if you had to pay me four hours, you know what I'm saying, for your commissary, how high your case gonna have to be you know if i'm charging top brain money but if you just paid me That's to come case. in you know what i'm saying per time or per whatever you didn't have this high overhead then it helps you and helps keep your pricing down helps make it affordable and it helps you grow it's not really about it's about keeping the lights on to allow somebody to grow with you so educate me. So typically, how much will a commissary? Cost. Well, right now there's one in Birmingham. I think it's like uh, one twenty-five. At one fifty a month. And the right that's for your space okay. and that comes with a couple of hours or so per um per month right so let's say mm. come about four or five hours per month with the 125 oh, or the right. 175 there but after you've used those hours you're talking about 25 to 35 dollars per hour as a cook wow hot dogs take hours So if I'm really cooking, no. I'm really catering. So I'm in here eight, nine, ten hours, right? That's mm -hmm. two, three hundred dollars just on the spot. 
That's not talking my about my helper, my helper, my product, my food. So it cuts into the, you know what I'm saying? The the bottom line. Mm. So now what I pass that price on to? Food mm. costs are already high. You know, people are, it's already hard to get good help. You know, speaking of that, I don't know if you can see her. She back there. See her? That's, that's my, face, my partner. She in the hole. She waving. She back there in the hole. But that's, that's Miss Cheryl. She, uh, man, when I tell you. Hey, Miss Cheryl. The bomb. The bomb troop. And she yeah. she helps me put things together. She helps me make sure it's right. Quality of food is right. And when it comes to bacon, ain't nothing like us. So, you know, it's Team Big Dad around here. But she and I have been like friends forever. And uh, ain't nothing I can't call to ask her to help me do. Like even with the small gig I got today, you know, we putting it together, but she gonna make sure it's right. She'll make sure it's presented right, make sure the taste is right. She ain't gonna let me put nothing out there that ain't ain't what it's ain't supposed to be. And so we're growing together and she's gonna be one of the main people that's gonna help, you know, run and establish this this new Um, business that we got up and coming, so we just we excited about. It. Okay, well, do your thing, Miss Cheryl. I see you out there. But uh, Dwayne, it, um, what's coming to my mind right now? Uh, I believe, I'm, I don't want to mess up the name. I think it's Seamless Launch. It's started by um, somebody that I know, and it's Damn really it's about that. like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know that name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, then you already know that. <laughs> here's here's the secret you don't know. Karen was my first promoter. She was the first person to believe in myself to help me put the name out there. Wow. She and I met uh, three and a half years ago, and I just I just couldn't afford the we quality. We better write the Yeah, I couldn't afford the quality of work that she was producing, and I told her before I hold you back, I'll let you go. And now we're like really good friends, and anything she needs, love her, love her husband, love the kids. Yeah, we we really, yeah, we. That's funny that you would even mention Karen name. I'm gonna tell them like somebody on the line was hollering at you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, yeah. We are uh, we connected. Oh, it would have been around like 2015, 2016. Mm -hmm. We was working for the same company at that time, and we just kept in contact. And you know, that was when I was in. Birmingham, but I haven't lived in Birmingham since then because I moved in 2016. But we still are really supportive of each other on social media, and to see the work that she's doing is amazing. So when people talk about, about um, you know, crowdfunding or things of that nature, ever since she came out and said, hey, you know, this what I'm doing. I try my best to say, hey, check this person out. Uh, this is somebody that is supportive of businesses. Have your stuff together, but make sure that this is someone you want to check out. But you oh, already yeah. got it. So you got to worry about it. Yeah, she the truth. And uh, she helped me jumpstart. And, and part of the reason why that process only took three years is because I had a I had a God bless me with a great team with no money. I mean I had people like Karen on my team, I had some other folks on my team, I had friends on my back, I had people like Miss Cheryl, 
there's folks that came in and just kind of believed in what you were doing. And when you produce a good product, people didn't have to. The one thing I'll say about this sauce, and every tried the sauce yet? That's I'm good. waiting to wrap up. I got my Chick-fil-A right here. We trying it online. What I need you to do is try this stuff before we go because the thing I want you to understand is that's the whole point. This that's the whole point. We right here. The sauce is a sauce that it doesn't need anything added to it. It's a good sauce. It's a cooking sauce, but it's the type of sauce. that the blessing in it is that you don't have to convince people would have like it. You know, you have some mediocre products some stuff you like oh please try my other sauce it, it, it. It's, it ain't cool feel the king but it, it's, it's close you know what I'm saying so Pause, you know, hold on, pause, pause, pause. Because, see, I was going to make a whole little moment out of it. But, see, first, you got to smell it first. Got to. You do. It jumped out that bottle, didn't it? It did. I ain't going to lie. Because I'm a snob when it comes to chicken and barbecue sauce and french fries. Like, those three things I'm kind of snobbish about. Well, I want you to go back to my page when you get off and watch some wings I posted today on uh, Instagram. I see these wings. All right, y'all. So you see it. It says award-winning Big Daddy Bomb barbecue sauce, right? And hopefully I can win the Food Truck Scholar Award, the first annual Food Truck Scholar barbecue sauce award. Whatever you <laughs> I like it. Don't, don't I like it. it. <laughs> don't spin it toward the, the camera. It ain't good. Just put your head down. And do no, like uh, uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I have That's faith. Good. I, I, I have faith. I ain't running from it. I ain't gonna even act like my live so look, dog, you know. I'm, I'm so through. I'm so through. So look, y'all. Uh, yeah. So we got Chick Fil A. We gonna we got Chick Fil A as like the test. So you know, the word of the Lord according to Chick Fil A. Let's do it. Okay. I Hold see up. you. Wait, stop right there because it's gonna come back to you. You feel it coming back? I'm mad that you knew that it was coming back. It does. It's that. After taste Come back. It came back to you, didn't it? <laughs> it is. But it's not. It's Not a um it's not a heavy sauce. 
for, you know, you have some sauce that is very thick and it takes a while to go down. It's not that at all. It's, um, it has a kick to it, but it's not like I need to grab water quick. Cause I, I wasn't sure. So I do have a water bottle right behind this phone just in case. Yeah, so it's yeah. not like that. You know, you gotta, the thing you gotta is, it's, it's sweet with a little heat. You know, goes mm -hmm. great on, it goes great on anything, any kind of meat. But uh, the secret is in that whole little people trying to figure out how you get it to go down my throat and come back and just chop the tonsils and be like, I was here, now I'm out. It is because it's just one of those things like it doesn't it doesn't linger. It goes away for a little bit, then it pops back up, and then it's go, it's down. Just very smooth. It's like a very, for lack of a better term, you ever had a vodka that when you drink it, it doesn't burn right then. Like and then you you feel it. That was Well, I, I do. I, I, I okay, know. well, follow my drinkers out there. <laughs> follow my say, drinkers yeah, out she, there. She, 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 hold she said she understands. She said, she okay, said she okay, understand. so Cheryl, Cheryl knows. Cheryl knows what I'm talking about. Thank you, Cheryl. So... <laughs> Is that we have a vodka and it goes down smooth, but you still feel it. You know that you had something. That's how. That's how this is. So, that is it. No, I said I told you it's been back to you, right? So why mm -hmm. Here's your second question. When you eat it, you ask myself, what is that that I taste? I taste barbecue sauce, but there's something else in it that I taste. That's what I'm trying to figure out. I'm trying to channel my inner Gaffieri. Uh-huh. You want me to tell you or you going to figure it out? Hey, they don't do the rest of I want to figure it out. I don't think I'm going to figure it out. It's the pineapple. <laughs> Look at God. That's what it is. That's my favorite. Fruit, too. But well, you know, the you thing is, is that I normally eat it raw. I don't Wait. really cook with it like that. Buy you one, put some this sauce on it, run it through the oven, you'll never eat pineapples plant again. Wait, ma'am. Hold up now. You said buy me a pineapple. You do what now? Put a little sauce on it, run it through the oven until it's tender. You'll never eat mm -hmm. plant again. Or take and put some um some get your pineapple mm -hmm. put you some honey butter spread on it oh lord with some uh cinnamon sugar with some barbecue sauce run it through the oven let it cook caramelize and it's gonna be a dessert hey love you i got to get out of here me I'm too i just day. look i gotta go to work <laughs> so Shoot so everybody we'll do so everybody dwayne thompson Get his barbecue sauce in the stores. Hit him up. Dwayne, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you for sharing. Look, you me at BDBBQ sauce. I need some more followers. So tell all your followers to follow me. I'm always doing something with some food, and uh, they can get at me.
All right. Follow him. I'll put out a post. Thank you all for watching. Mr. Arkees. Thank you for being a supporter and for commenting. We I appreciate see him, I see you. Him. We appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Food Trust Scholar, BB. Signing out. See ya. Uh -huh.